Good morning, friends and neighbors, and welcome to Soundbites with Bill Wood, a certified lay minister at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in El Paso, Texas, where our mission is to love God, follow Jesus, and serve others. And again, if you have any joys or prayer requests, please send them to the St. Paul's email address so that we may pray with you and rejoice with you. If you would now, please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we... Thank you for the many blessings that you shower upon, that, upon us each day. Praise your name for ministering to us and taking care of us and causing us to prosper in all that we do, especially in the ministry that you have called us into. Now, Father, I believe that as we prepare our hearts now and minds to receive from you as we study your word that you will speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of Hebrews, and we will read verses 9 through 12. So Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust, and he will not forget your work, and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and, con and continue to help them, we want each of you to show the same diligence in the, to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, <clears throat> but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. Now, even though in the preceding verses the writer has sternly rebuked those that he's writing to, he now, in love, is offering encouragement, encouraging them to continue in the things that accompany salvation. And when he says things that accompany salvation, I believe he is he may be thinking about the work that they have done in word and in deed, deed as they have gone about in their ministry. Uh, he also may be thinking that they have become weary, as, or as we would call it, experiencing burnout, and have become in their ministry, and, they, and is now sharing with them that God is faithful and will not forget their efforts to share the good news, even though they have become sluggish in their er efforts. I think he may mean that even if they don't see immediate results, don't become lazy and give up. Look at the work of the saints and imitate those who, through faith and patience, did indeed inherit what was promised. And he says more about this and about the saints in chapter 11 which we will look at at a later time. But now let us read verses 13 through 15 of this chapter 6. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised promised. Verse, verse 13 says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. Now, which promise is the writer referring to uh, in this verse? Because as we look through Genesis, we find that God on many different occasions made a promise to Abram. And the first of this we find in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, where God called Abram to leave his father's household and go into the land that God would show him. In verse 2 and 3 says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. An indication of Abram being blessed then is found in Genesis 13, chapter or chapter 13, verse 24. And this is the first mention of Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest of God Most High. 
the writer says more about this in chapter 7. But in Genesis 15, the, the chapter 15, Abraham is having a conversation with God, lamenting the fact that he has no son to receive his inheritance. And God assures Abram that he will indeed have a son and does this with a covenant referring to the promise. You can read this in chapter 17, verses 8 through 21. I think God reiterates his promise in chapter 17 that he makes the covenant of, when he makes the covenant of circumcision. And at that time, God also changed his name to Abraham and he changed Sarah, his wife's name, to Sarah, changed it from Sarah to Sarah. <clears throat> and then in chapter 18, God again told Abraham that he would have a son born to his wife, Sarah, even in their old age. As you can see, there are several references to the promises in the promise in Genesis. Then verse 15 of this chapter 6 says, So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. This, I believe, is the writer's example of what those who read this letter could expect if they do not become lazy, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherited what was promised them, as stated in verse 12. Now, Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years before their son was born, and then that was, was not the conclusion of the promise, as we'll find as we read later on in chapter 18, verses uh, 16 through 18, I believe it is. We'll come to that in a little while. Then in, in this chapter 16, or chapter 6, let us read verses 16 through 20, where the writer continues his thought of the promise, stating, Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make an unchanging nature of his promise very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have failed to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, entered on our, entered on to entered on our behalf. He has promised a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now I think what he's referring to here in the this this last couple of sentences is that Jesus is the high priest and he entered the sanctuary behind the curtain on our behalf and made it possible then for us to commune with God directly. This reference here in Genesis, uh, I think this references the promise that was made in Genesis 22, verses 16 through 20, which is God's conversation with Abraham after Abraham had offered Isaac on the altar. And God stopped him before he was then, before he did any harm to Isaac. And this is the promise that God made to Abraham and confirmed with an oath. It's a promise that the writer is referring to in these verses. Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 to 18 reads like this. And <clears throat> this is what I was talking about earlier about uh, the oath that he made and his war by or the promise he made and swore by an oath, where the angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and all and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations of the earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. 
Now this is again the second time where he mentions that all nations or all peoples of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham. And we have already discussed the fact that God made many promises to Abraham, but as I said a little earlier, this is the only one that he made with an oath. And Barclay's, Barclay's commentary has this to say about this promise. And this is found in the, his letter to the Hebrews, pages 73 through 75. And he's talking about the promise that God made here, found as I just read in Genesis 20 to chapter 22. He says the real meaning of this first sentence of chapter 6, verse 16, where men swear by someone greater than themselves, he says the real meaning of this first sentence is that God made many promises to Abraham, and in the end, he actually made one which he confirmed with a note. That promise was, as it were, doubly binding. It was God's word which in itself made it sure, but in addition, it was confirmed by an oath. Now that promise was that all Abraham's descendants would be blessed. Therefore, that promise was to the Christian church, for the church was the true Israel, Israel and the true seed of Abraham. That blessing came true in Jesus Christ. Abraham certainly had to experience patience before he received the promise, and it was not until 75 years after he left Ur that his son Isaac was born. He, he, <coughs> he was old, and Sarah was barren. The wondering was long, but Abraham never wavered from his hope and trust in the promise of God. That hope, he says, is one which enters into the inner court beyond the veil. In the temple, the most sacred of all places was the Holy of Holies. The veil was what covered it. It was believed that anyone who entered the Holy of Holies entered into the very presence of God, and to that place only one man in all of the world could go. That man was the high priest, and even he entered that holy place on only one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. Even then, <clears throat> it is laid down that he must not linger in it, for it was a dangerous and terrible thing to enter into the presence of the living God. What the writer to the Hebrews says is that under the, <clears throat> under the old Jewish religion, no one might enter into the presence of God but the high priest. He was the only one, and he only did that on one day of the year. But now Jesus Christ has opened the way for everyone at that very time, every individual at every time. Then he says, let us put it very simply in another way, because Jesus became God before Jesus became God, no, this is the way that sentence reads. <clears throat> Let us put it very simply in another way. Before Jesus came, God was the distant stranger who only a few might approach and at, their, at the peril of their lives. But because of what Jesus did, was, and did, God has become a friend of all. Once people thought him to be as a barring to the door, now they think of the door, think the door to his presence is thrown wide open to all. And I believe that <clears throat> this is what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross and then rose again. He opened the door for all of us to come and communicate with God. In Genesis 22, 18, it says, Through your offspring, and that offspring is singular, all nations on the earth will be blessed. And I believe that this offspring that is referring to there is Jesus, and it was through Jesus that all nations will be blessed and that all nations have been blessed. So this is a very difficult passage to um, 
come to an understanding with, and you may want to read this again and go back and review these promises in Genesis to fully understand what is taking place with all of this. And I will be on vacation next week, so our next study will be April the 11th, and we will study chapter 7, where the writer again begins his thoughts on Jesus as being the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, I have enjoyed sharing with you uh, this morning, and if you have any comments or different ideas on these verses, please send them to the St. Paul's email address, and I will address them. I would love to hear from you, so have a wonderful time in the Lord, and may the Lord continue to richly bless you. Go in peace and in the love of God.